Zealand, unlike Germany, where you know we have some degree of removal, so you know we don't have any laws against it. Uh, if you're but, being too enthusiastic about it, a lot of people will raise a hairy eyeball at you. But you um, did say if you draw the short straw and get to play the um, the bad guys, well, that, 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 there are that, that when... implies that you really you want to be the that there, there is something morally wrong about playing the bad guys. That the the nice job is playing the good guys. Well, everybody wants to be the guys that won or the guys that was you know their grandfather was in. But also, there are some periods of history where you know very unpleasant things happened on either side. You know, any war is an atrocity. Sure. And there are some. You know, in World War One, it's very hard to get anybody to do World War One Turkish just because nobody really studies very much about them. Mm. So, it's a thing where you have to find a source of uniforms and just say, like, okay, for this morning's display, we need twenty Turks. Who's going to you know? put their finger in the hat and be the short straw to be one of our Turks for this skirmish for the mounted rifles if we're doing a World War One thing. So it's not so much that people are going out of their way to reenact with particular groups, but you're often finding that, OK, we're reenacting this battle and here the Kiwis were fighting against these people. OK, so we have to make that uniform, and it might be a particularly unpleasant uniform. Mm. It's interesting to hear uh, that. Uh, Zane, thank you. Dr Zane Bruce on the reenactments. Uh, actually, just quickly... Because uh, I want to mention Greg Boyd as well. The US has deported this 95-year-old former Nazi camp guard uh, to Germany, Jackie Pali, and he's lived quietly in the US for years. Uh, back in the 1980s, actually, they discovered who he was, but he managed to live on in limbo, and German prosecutors say there's not enough evidence to charge him with war crimes. But he's gone, and they carried him out on a stretcher. Extradite him now, at the age of 95, or let him die in New York. Considering there wasn't enough evidence to charge him for war crimes, it, it doesn't seem fair to deport him at the age of 95. Yeah, it's an interesting quandary. Joe? So are the Americans kicking him out, or, or are the Israelis uh, extraditing him, or what? What's the story? Well, uh, Jewish groups have called for his extradition and have conducted a, a protest outside his home for years. And so the Americans have acquiesced? In the that. Americans have finally, uh, yeah, and, enough and he's being energy has been uh, eventually, I think he'll be headed for Germany, but he may not be prosecuted. That's the interesting part, because the prosecutors there don't su suspect there's not it's enough a difficult evidence one, isn't it? it? raises the question of rehabilitation again, doesn't it? It's how, how long him. do you give someone? It's a bit late. <laughs> a bit late for him. Uh, TVNZ News presenter Greg Boyd, uh, who was battling depression, has died in Switzerland, and tributes have been pouring in for his professional abilities and talents and his kindness and warmth as a human being. He was very well loved. And our sympathies uh, go out to everyone who was close to Greg. It, it is a shock, isn't it, when anyone dies in sad circumstances, exacerbated for most people, I think, in Greg's case, because they saw him as such a calm and capable presence on TV. Uh, I know you don't watch TV, but, Joe, you will have seen a lot of uh, Greg Boyd over the years. I'm afraid I... No, I, I wouldn't know him. I'm sorry. Really? Yeah, I don't watch television news. It's interesting that we've got two panellists on today who both say the same thing because you actually make a choice not to watch too much television. I don't have a TV. I couldn't if I want... Well, I don't want to. That's why I don't have one. I, I, Nevertheless. I, 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 watch, I watch a reasonable amount of television, but I, I don't watch television news as a rule, local television news. Nevertheless, a lot of people uh, do, and they were very fond of Greg. And uh, we're very sad to learn today of his passing. There are a lot of people upset here at RNZ as well. All right, thank you both for your company today. Joe Bennett, always a pleasure. Thank you, Jim. And Rebecca White. Thank nice you. Nice to have you back as well. Uh, we are back tomorrow with the panel and checkpoints with John Campbell coming right up. Tonight on Checkpoint, Manafort found guilty, Cohen says guilty, and step-by-step -step Robert Mueller seems to be getting closer to the president. Our guest tonight is the BBC's North America editor, John Sopel. Also tonight, are courier drivers employees or independent contractors? The Workplace Relations Minister meets with Freightways and we talk to him afterwards, and then we talk to the CEO of Freightways himself. Across the Tasman, Peter Dutton looks set to have another crack at Malcolm Turnbull. Turnbull says all is well and you can almost hear him over the sound of knives being sharpened. And after all the fuss about power pole safety in Dunedin, how safe are they? All of that and much more coming up on Checkpoint tonight. Thank you for being with us. Uh, in a moment, the news and Katrina's back.
RNZ News at five. Kia ora, good afternoon. Call Katrina Batten, then nay. The police are keeping a close eye on the suburb of Castlecliff in Whanganui after a gang shooting left a man dead. The 27-year-old victim and father of two, understood to be Kevin Ratana, died at the Pūrere Street scene yesterday. Lee Marama McLaughlin is in Whanganui. The grassroots community of Castlecliff is reeling after the killing, which sparked a large police hunt. The police are yet to name the victim, but RNZ understands he was Kevin Ratana, a non-member of the mongrel mob. The gang-related shooting happened between 9 and 10 o'clock in the morning. Neighbours and locals say it's scary and it could spark further tension between rivals Black Power and the mongrel mob. The police have brought in officers from New Plymouth, Palmerston North and Wellington for the homicide investigation. A cordon is expected to be removed tonight or tomorrow. I'm Lee Mardimer McLaughlin. The American president has tried to distance himself from his former campaign chairman's conviction on fraud charges. Arriving in West Virginia for a rally, Donald Trump said he felt very badly for Paul Manafort, but the case has nothing to do with him. A federal jury this morning found Manafort guilty on eight charges of tax evasion and bank fraud. A short time later, Mr Trump's former lawyer, Michael Cohen, struck a plea deal with prosecutors on tax evasion and financial campaign violations and implicated Mr Trump by saying he was directed to make a payment by a candidate for federal office. The Transport Minister has described cowboy wheel clampers as predatory as the government introduces new rules making it illegal to charge more than $100 to remove a wheel clamp. In the past, some people have reportedly been charged as much as $700 to free their vehicle. Now businesses caught charging above the new cap face fines of between $1 and $3,000 and up to $15,000 if the matter goes to court. Phil Twyford says it's become a curse for some communities and has made people feel anxious. Some of these people are real predators. They, they, I have no uh, patience with them whatsoever and it's long past time that we step in and regulate in the way that we are. And I don't think the public have any sympathy with people who engage in predatory behaviour. The Transport Minister says wheel clamping has also been bad for business, with some areas getting a bad reputation. Peter Dutton has given his clearest indication he intends to challenge the Australian Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull for his job for the second time. The former Home Affairs Minister has confirmed he's working the phones to try to convince the seven colleagues he needs to tip the leadership ballot in his favour after a failed bid for the top job yesterday. The ABC's Caitlin Gribbon reports from Canberra. Peter Dutton's backers are increasingly confident he'll have the numbers to win another leadership challenge. He's told Melbourne's 3AW he's talking to colleagues to gauge their support for him. If I believe that the majority of colleagues support me, then I would consider my position. One source close to Mr Dutton believes another two or three Liberals have drifted to him overnight. But the party's deputy, Julie Bishop, insists Malcolm Turnbull has majority support. Ms Bishop and fellow Cabinet Ministers Matthias Corman, Scott Morrison and Christopher Pine are among those seen entering the Prime Minister's office today. Caitlin Gribbon in Canberra. The Prime Minister has remembered TVNZ journalist Greg Boyd as a thoughtful interviewer who was quick to share a laugh. The 48-year-old died suddenly while on holiday with his family in Switzerland. Jesse Chang reports. Craig Boyd's family say he had been battling depression. They have paid tribute to him as the kindest and most caring man and a devoted father who cherished his two children. Tributes and messages have been pouring in for Mr Boyd, including from Jacinda Ardern. In a tweet, she says she was saddened to hear of his passing and her thoughts are with his family, friends and colleagues. TVNZ's Head of News and Current Affairs, John Gillespie, says Mr Boyd had been a prominent figure in the newsroom for 25 years and was a talented broadcaster who strongly believed in the power and importance of journalism in people's lives. Call Jesse Chang, TNA. The son of all-black legend George Napier, who died while serving as a soldier overseas, has returned home to the small East Coast settlement of Tikitiki. Also named George, he died in Singapore while serving with the Fijian Battalion in 1954. He was one of 28 defence personnel repatriated from Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam and Singapore in a ceremony at Auckland Airport yesterday. 
A church service was held for George Nepia at St Mary's Church before a moving porphyry took place today at Hinepare Marae at Rangitukia on the east coast. He'll be buried at his family Urupa tomorrow. The Commerce Commission is prosecuting Vodafone over historical broadband billing errors. The Commission says the phone company breached the Fair Trading Act by overcharging a group of broadband customers who terminated their service between 2012 and 2016. Vodafone's chief executive, Russell Stanners, says it's disappointed with the regulator's decision, saying the errors, which totaled about $140,000, were unintentional. Mr Sanders says the company had fully cooperated with the regulator to rectify the situation, including tracking down and refunding customers and donating unclaimed money to charity. It's five minutes past five. Sport. Support is growing for the beleaguered Black Sticks women's hockey coach Mark Hager, with seven former players writing an open letter in support of him. In it, the group dismisses suggestions of a negative environment within the side. It was revealed last week that Black Sticks coach Hager mistakenly sent an email criticising several players to the entire playing squad and subsequently led to criticism of Hager's methods. An independent review of the Black Sticks high performance environment is now to take place. The former internationals Katie Glynn, Crystal Ferguson, Emily Gadam, Bianca Russell, Anna Alexander, Lucy Talbot and uh, Laura Douglas have all signed the letter saying Hager didn't mistreat, bully or play mind games with players. The letter said in Hager's time with the side he's taken them from 13th in the world to 3rd. The Wellington Phoenix Football Club say they never got the chance to trial sprint legend Usain Bolt. The world's fastest man has just started an indefinite trial period with the Central Coast Mariners, with the eight-time Olympic champion hoping to become a professional footballer. The Phoenix general manager David Dome says there's no doubt that Bolt's arrival in Australia has produced huge interest, but the Jamaican superstar was never on their radar. He was not touted around the A-League. He was not offered up to all the clubs like some players um, have been. And there's no doubt that the guy can kick a ball. He's not absolutely clueless. He does have some level of skill. It's just whether he can fit into a role that the head coach the Mariners wanted to play. David Dome, that's the news. Kia ora, g'day, Paul Brennan on Nights After 7 tonight on RNZ National. We find out about a book that captures in photos the complete environmental transformation that occurred through many parts of New Zealand following European settlement. It's called Wild Boar Photos. Also, South Korea has the lowest fertility rate in the world and the country's population will start shrinking unless something changes. But an increasing number of South Korean women are choosing not to marry, not to have children, not even to have relationships with men. More on that and more tonight after seven on nights. What's more quintessentially Christchurch than a burnt out Subaru legacy in front of an earthquake damaged cathedral? <laughs> Melted ice cream present 100% unheard Otatahi hits. This track is off it. It's the Waltham Home Organ Society with a track called Ray Columbus. It's Lately with Karen Hay, 10pm weeknights on RNZ National. Met service weather through to midnight tomorrow for the northern half of the North Island from Taranaki and Taupo northwards, including Bay of Plenty. Periods of rain or showers sometimes heavy, with a chance of squally thunderstorms and hail until tomorrow morning. Fine spells increasing tomorrow afternoon. Gisborne and Hawke's Bay, scattered rain developing overnight, then clearing tomorrow afternoon. Whanganui, Taihepe, Manawatu and Horofenua. A few showers turning to rain for a time tomorrow. Kapiti, Wellington and Wairarapa, mostly fine today. Rain at times tomorrow, possibly heavy in Wairarapa. Nelson, Buller and Westland, remaining showers clearing this evening, fine tomorrow. Marlborough, Canterbury and North Otago, fine today. Scattered showers developing tomorrow. Central Otago, Dunedin, Clutha, Southland and Fiordland. Rain about the south coast and scattered falls elsewhere and the Chatham Islands. A few showers today, rain developing tomorrow afternoon. It's nine and a half past five and you're listening to Checkpoint. Thanks KB, nice to have you back. Thanks everyone for joining us. Let's begin tonight in the US where Special Counsel Robert Mueller has won a significant victory in the first trial arising from his investigation into Russia's role in the 2016 election. After almost four days of deliberations, a 
12-member jury found Trump's campaign chairman, Paul Manafort, guilty on two counts of bank fraud, five counts of tax fraud, and one charge of failing to disclose foreign bank accounts. That was in Virginia. At the same time in New York, something that may be even more problematic for the president was taking place. Donald Trump's former personal lawyer, Michael Cohen, was pleading guilty to campaign finance violations and other charges. Now, the name Trump was not heard in that courtroom. Cohen himself said a candidate directed him to act. But Cohen's lawyer was not so subtle. Donald Trump directed him to commit a crime by making payments to two women for the principal purpose of influencing an election, Lanny Davis said. In short, as the BBC's North America editor John Sopel told me, Mueller's case is starting to really mount. Well, what we have had stated in court as part of the guilty plea by Michael Cohen, and remember, Michael Cohen is the long-standing uh, lawyer to Donald Trump, Mr. Fix-It. He was a vice chair of the Republicans' uh, campaign committee. So he's a big player. And he has said in court that he broke campaign law in coordination with and at the direction of uh, a candidate for federal office, brackets the president. So in saying that, he is saying that he was acting as a co-conspirator to Donald Trump and therefore to win an election uh, and misinform the public. Now, that, of course, is very, very difficult for Donald Trump to walk away from. The other case kind of may be less serious. Paul Manafort, who was the campaign manager in the months leading up to uh, the election, he was there kind of in a, a brief period. But the charges against him related to an earlier time, predating his association with Donald Trump. So i tell you what I thought was the most telling thing. Donald Trump lands in West Virginia, where he's got a rally tonight. And he comes over to the cameras because he knows there is intense interest at the courtroom drama that unfolded. He talks about Paul Manafort and says he feels sad for him. And when the question came about Michael Cohen, he had nothing to say. He didn't say a word. And I think that's because it is very much more difficult uh, for the White House to spin what Michael Cohen has said compared to what's happened to Paul Manafort. Yes, if we look at what Cohen was saying, the words are so damning, aren't they? For the principal purpose of influencing the election, uh, that's pretty much a verbatim quote. Where does this leave the president? Well, I, let me give you a flavour of what we're going to hear, because we've had a very brief statement uh, from Rudy Giuliani, who is now the president's lawyer, the president's counsel, and he says there is no allegation of any wrongdoing against the president in the government's charges against Mr. Cohen. It is clear that, as the prosecutor noted, Mr. Cohen's actions reflect a pattern of lies and dishonesty over a significant period of time. So let's just kind of split that in two. It's true that there is no allegation of wrongdoing against the president in the government charges against Mr. Cohen. But, of course, Mr. Cohen's statement that if they are considered plausible could open up all sorts of inquiries about what the president knew and when about the payments uh, to these two women, uh, Karen McDougall, a former Playmate of the Year, and Stormy Daniels, uh, a porn star actress, both of whom were paid off in the months before the election, both of whom alleged affairs with Donald Trump, and Donald Trump denied that. And so the statement from Giuliani is absolutely correct. There is no allegation of wrongdoing uh, in the government's charges against Mr. Cohen. And what, the, what Rudy Giuliani is doing, as you would expect him to do, is to say, you know what, that Michael Cohen is an inveterate liar. We knew that all along. Um, and so, you know, he's, he's already been found guilty of dishonesty, so we shouldn't detain ourselves with this any longer. Well, we'll see. I think that it doesn't go away quite as easily as that. Yes, the we'll see is the key phrase here. And isn't Muller looking a singular, tenacious and fastidious character? He is. And there is one of the things that they are looking at in relation to Michael Cohen is a claim that Donald Trump knew about a meeting in Trump Tower, the famous meeting with a Russian lawyer with very close links to the Kremlin promising dirt on Hillary Clinton. Now, Donald Trump has repeatedly said he knew nothing about that meeting and nothing came of it. Well, Michael Cohen is saying otherwise. So that might be an area of investigation. You've also got uh, the Senate committee saying, uh, the Senate Intelligence Committee saying, we want to look at that now. So we'd like to talk to Michael Cohen about some of these other things. You know, Donald Trump is desperate 
to put this in his rearview mirror. And every time he thinks he's got kind of broken away, it's like one of those kind of car chases that he thinks, oh, it's disappearing, it's disappearing, I've got away from him. The car comes looming up in the background. And I think that this whole subject is not going away. What I would say in mitigation, for, you know, we get very caught up. You and me, the media, get caught up by the dramas of what has unfolded, and it was spectacular. I mean, within two minutes, you had two separate federal courthouses delivering a verdict. But in West Virginia tonight, are people going to be more obsessed about what's happened in New York and what happened in Alexandria today in court? Or are they going to be more motivated about the state of the economy, about the things that they, that they believe Donald Trump is doing to help them and their livelihoods, uh, the deregulation that is helping the economy, the tougher measures on immigration? It may be that this is just another one of those things where we all think, well, there's no escape from this one, as the fire closes in around Donald Trump and the flames start licking at his feet. Or maybe he just walks scot-free once again. John Sopel in Washington. Let's head from Washington to Whanganu, where the community of Castlecliff is reeling after a fatal gang shooting that sparked a large police hunt. A 27-year-old man who police are yet to name, but RNZ understands as Kevin Ratana died at the scene on Pudiri Street yesterday morning. Witnesses say the offenders fled on foot and police have called in extra support from around the country to try to find them. Lee Marama McLaughlin is in Whanganui. Dozens of patched Mungle Mob members congregated at a church at the edge of the cordon on Pudity Street today, just a few houses down from where one of their own was shot dead outside a home at about 9.30 yesterday morning. Carl lives across the road and was home when the shooting happened. Yeah, I seen it, but I was just painting a picture. I heard the first shot, looked out the window, seen a few guys running across the road. So I went and grabbed my nephew, heard a couple more shots, so I took him in the hallway and then looked out the window and they were gone. And then about, like, two minutes later, like, this lady started screaming, called the ambulance. Carl made sure his nephew was OK and looked again out the window. I could see, like, I'm pretty sure I saw, like, broken window at the house. Yeah, and um, one guy got shot in the head in his front lawn, I'm pretty sure. The incident sent nearby schools and early childcare centres into lockdown for the day. A large section of the corner of Pudity Street was blocked off and armed officers have been guarding it since. Locals report having armed police combing their properties for hours last night. Just up the road at the local dairy, Samaya Sanna says it's been frightening. Yeah, it is pretty scary, but like the cops were here yesterday and all the, um, the ones with the armour guard and everything like that. So there's just like the cops going past and everything and people when they come to our shop they tell us what's going on out there like uh, I think what I've heard so far is because the guy who was shot like her, um, his his wife was with him as well so it was pretty sad like because she was just sitting there crying when he just got shot so it was really sad. The police have yet to identify the 27 year old victim but friends and family have named him as Kevin Ratana on social media a father to two. His body was removed from the scene at around midday today. Police have launched an extensive hunt for the offenders, bringing in officers from New Plymouth, Palmerston North and Wellington. They say the victim and offenders were gang affiliates who were known to each other and the police. Gary Battersby runs the Big Barrel Liquor Store on Purdity Street and has been there for 15 years. Um, probably Mungrel Mob have come into Black Power territory as far as I can tell. Is it Black Power territory down here? Pretty much, yeah. Well, how's the community feeling? A little bit shaken, I think, you know. We've been pretty quiet in here for yesterday and just about all day today. It's been real quiet. It's not the first time something like this has rocked the community. Just over 10 years ago, a two-year-old was shot in a drive-by just houses down. The acting mayor, Jenny Duncan, says the community is traumatised, but the public is not at risk. Our main reaction was um, our thoughts were with the family affected and that community and um, wanting to make sure that they're fully supported through this time. But this is a, a one-off event. It was very unexpected. Um, we're a vibrant small city that doesn't have a gang problem any more than anywhere else. We just want to assure them that the police know what they're doing. We've got a strong presence here. They've got the matter under control. Cars with police could be seen driving around Castlecliff streets all day, keeping a protective gaze over the community and an eye out for any further trouble. In Whanganui for Checkpoint, I'm Lee Marama McLaughlin.
Let's go to Australia now where the sharks are circling for the Prime Minister as Peter Dutton and his supporters regroup and prepare for a second leadership challenge. Despite winning yesterday's leadership challenge 48 votes to 35, Malcolm Turnbull has endured the ignominy of nine ministers having now either resigned or offering to do so. Mr Dutton's supporters say the Prime Minister's leadership is terminal. While the Turnbull camp warns a second leadership challenge could force a snap election, which the coalition would lose. The ABC's Alexandra Beach reports. One by one, the Prime Minister's supporters are falling like dominoes. Ten front benches have now offered their resignation. As one of them, Conchetta Ferraventi Wells, took her new seat on the backbench this morning, Labor senators heckled from across the chamber. <laughs> Malcolm Turnbull's rejected most of these resignation offers, instead asking the rogue ministers to stay on in their jobs. He's trying to maintain some semblance of unity and avoid the headache of a reshuffle. But Senator Firavanti Wells, like Peter Dutton, has stuck to her guns and is now free to speak her mind from the backbench. Uh, it's important to uh, understand the party, understand the base and understand uh, the need to have an appropriate balance. And I I feel that Peter, uh, having had a long uh, history uh, in the party, and I believe that Peter uh, would uh, make a good Prime Minister. She says the party's Conservative base isn't happy. Now, we have seen votes walking away from the Liberal Party. We are not bleeding from the left. We are bleeding from the right. And that is because our Conservative base is walking away from us. Meanwhile, Peter Dutton's been presenting what looks an awful lot like a job application and a policy manifesto in a series of media interviews. Here he is speaking on Melbourne radio station Triple M. I think one of the things that we could do uh, straight away uh, in this next billing cycle is take the GST off electricity bills for families, where it would be an automatic reduction of 10% for electricity bills. And if his comments on another Melbourne station, 3AW, are anything to go by, he'll soon be back to try to finish Malcolm Turnbull off. I believe I can beat Bill Shorten. I believe we can uh, and, and that we must. Asked if he was working the phones to shore up his numbers, he said... I'm not, not going to beat around the bush with that, mate. I'm happy to be honest and say yes, I'm talking to colleagues. Colleagues are talking to me. Those still loyal to Malcolm Turnbull are warning a Dutton Prime Ministership could be very short-lived. At least one now Nationals MP Darren Chester is threatening to quit the party and go to the crossbench if Mr Dutton becomes Prime Minister, potentially triggering an election. The problem I have is the idea of uh, seeing another Prime Minister not finish their term. I, my problem is with this uh, iconic building, the Australian Parliament, not being able to get on to the job it's meant to do. To get around that problem, the party could turn to someone else, a compromise candidate. One name being thrown around is Scott Morrison, but he's told reporters that's nonsense. Will you move well, last term to step aside? No. No? Are you doing the numbers for Peter Dutton now? No. Are you the consensus candidate your party needs? No. With his support collapsing, the Prime Minister is unlikely to survive much longer. Some MPs are tipping he won't last the week. Alexandra Beach in Canberra for the ABC, 23 past five. The Transport Minister, we're home again, has described wheel clampers as predators and a curse on society, with the government announcing stricter controls following years of public outcry over hefty, unwarranted and unilateral fines. Parking enforcement services have until now been able to charge whatever they want to remove clamps from cars parked on private property, with some people charged as high as $700 to have a clamp off. Stories of people caught out by the system are fairly regular, prompting the government to try to step in. Well, they have stepped in to try to regulate it. But as Tom Furley reports, Phil Twyford, yep, yeah, he wants change. We gave a New Zealand Music Month concert for free. Outside the library they wheel clamped me. They fined me $200. That's Auckland musician Sasha Tane Wittenhanna. After he was clamped in 2016, he turned his experience into a song. In March, Lindy Wellington and her partner had a run-in at exactly the same spot after parking in an unmarked park opposite the library for five minutes. After a long, heated exchange, the clamper agreed to release the car, but took her licence and car details and told Lindy to expect a $200 fine in the mail. But that hasn't come, and now she's more afraid to go out with the threat of it hanging over her head. That's my biggest fear, is the fact that, you know, because 
uh, they didn't win the first time, they're going to come back and do it all over again. Yeah. So I make sure when I'm out in public, I either have somebody with me that can sit in the car at all full time, or I'm rushing. And I, you know, when I do go out for specific things, I, I don't end up getting it because I'm just too scared to even just park the car and go in and get it. Like, it's really bad. One of the most notorious spots in West Auckland was, until recently, a car park in Henderson on Cell Peacock Drive. Complaints about the amount of clamping forced the hand of the site's owner, which has now given the car park management to Wilson Car Parks. Speaking there today, the Minister of Commerce and Consumer Affairs, Chris Farfoy, says the government hopes to change the law and put a cap on how much people can be charged. The problems that we've seen have been uh, excessive charging for the removal of wheel clamps um, in the area of several hundred dollars. So to make sure we do target those cowboy clampers, a, a limit of $100 we think will take care of that. Chris Farfoy says they did consider a full ban but decided to balance consumer protection with the rights of private property owners. Transport Minister Phil Twyford says the new law would also allow the police to get involved if clampers try to charge more than $100. Some of these people are real predators. They, they, I have no uh, patience with them whatsoever and it's long past time that we step in and regulate in the way that we are. And I don't think the public have any sympathy with people who engage in predatory behaviour uh, like uh, some of the worst cowboy uh, wheel clamping that we've seen. The news has been welcomed in part by the AA and clamping victims RNZ has spoken to. However, most, like Lindy Wellington, say more needs to be done. Can't they bring tow trucks back in? Why can't they do it that way rather than clamp somebody's car and demand cash on the spot? I mean, you know, even $100, like, yeah, it's, it's a good idea, but $100 is even a lot of money as well. The government aims to have the law introduced to Parliament by the end of the year. For Checkpoint, Tom Furley. It's been a hearing for disputed facts in which the facts are not disputed. The question has been about intent. Yes, eight days in the Dunedin District Court, not to determine uh, guilt, but intention on the part of Silverhorn Limited when between 2011 and 2015 it sold 22 batches of deer velvet pills, which contained less deer velvet than their label stated. Our Otago Southern reporter Timothy Brown has sat through much of the evidence and was there for the last of it today. The label said they contained 250 milligrams of deer velvet. The reality is it was much less and topped up with carob, a cocoa substitute. Silberhorn, now known as Gateway Solutions Limited, admitted 26 charges of engaging in conduct liable to mislead for the 22 batches of deer velvet pills and online marketing material. The company and its sole director, Ian Carline, each pleaded guilty to withholding information from the Commerce Commission. But that's where it gets messy. Mr Carline says the pills were far more potent after a change in manufacturing process. The processing was different and the, uh, the uh, outcome was different. I, I would say that we could uh, probably use half as much and, and have a similar effect. However, that conclusion was drawn off empirical science as Mr Carline described. He says high doses of deer velvet cause nosebleeds and after the manufacturing change the same quantity of his product produced nosebleeds. But the Commerce Commission through lawyer John Dixon QC criticised that as a woefully inadequate process and utterly unscientific. Would you accept that that was an unscientific process? It's empirical and that's quite common with uh, natural products. Um... Would you accept it was an unscientific process? I would, I would say it's, uh, uh, of the science of the day, it's, it's, it's up there. When, when, when you're leading in what you do, there's no one to follow. The Commission says the quantity of deer velvet was dialled back with the knowledge of the company's director and with the intent to increase profit. Today, the defence called expert witness Dr Stephen Haynes of Ag Research. He says the manner which Silberhorn uses to preserve its deer velvet, a process which he describes as unique in utilising cold, the details of which have been suppressed, is very effective at maintaining the product as close to its natural state as possible. But Dr Haynes carried out his study of Silberhorn's product and its comparison to others in the market last year. And that's when Mr Dixon threw a spanner in the works. Now, we have heard evidence that during the... The relevant period for us, 2011 to 2013, the powder that was used for almost all of the period was not freeze-dried. Right. It was dried in a 
rotary vacuum tumbler for 18 hours at 60 degrees. Dr Haynes says heat affects the quality of the final product and therefore the powder he analysed is different to the one sold by Silberhorn for much of the period that the charges relate to. The question of whether Silberhorn intended to mislead its customers by providing less product than was on the label will be determined by Judge Kevin Phillips. He has reserved his decision and the case will again be before the court on September the 12th for sentencing submissions. In the Dunedin District Court for Checkpoint, Timothy Brown. You are with Chip Wynn on RNZ. Thank you for being with us. Coming up on the programme are courier drivers, employees or independent contractors. The Workplace Relations Minister met with Freightways boss Mark Tro here today. Uh, both of them join us between now and six. Known as next with business news. Would love your feedback on anything we are covering. Text us 2101 or email checkpoint at radionz.co.nz. But with the time at 5.30, here is Katrina Batten with the 5.30 headlines. The lawyer for a former teacher aide and rugby coach accused of sexual offending is denying the charges, saying it's all lies. Alosio Taimo is on trial at the High Court in Auckland on 83 charges of sexual offending against 18 boys over a period of nearly 30 years. His lawyer has told the jurors some victims went to the same school and have fabricated their stories. Panama Lia Ao Anai questioned how his client could have offended in his car in daylight and in the sport, school sports shed when other students and even teachers were around. The police have brought in reinforcements in their hunt for those responsible for a fatal gang shooting in the Whanganui suburb of Castlecliff yesterday. They are yet, they're yet to name the victim, but RNZ understands it was Kevin Ratana, a 27-year-old father of two and a known member of the mongrel mob. Armed officers have been guarding the scene in Puriri Street. Donald Trump is trying to distance himself from the conviction of his former campaign chairman on tax evasion and bank fraud charges. The US president says he feels very badly for Paul Manafort, but the case has nothing to do with him. Shortly afterwards, Mr Trump's former lawyer, Michael Cohen, implicated Mr Trump by saying he was directed to make a payment by a candidate for a federal office. The Transport Minister Phil Twyford says some wheel clampers he has described as cowboys are predatory. He's announced new rules making it illegal to charge more than $100 to remove a clamp. Some people have been charged up to $700 to unclamp their vehicle. Those caught charging above the new cap will be fined up to $3,000. Across the Tasman, as momentum builds for Peter Dutton's a second challenge to Malcolm Turnbull's leadership, two of his most senior colleagues have publicly pledged support for their leader. But Mr Dutton and his supporters remain confident they can replace Mr Turnbull as Prime Minister with another move as early as this week. Those are the headlines. I'll be back at six and you guys can stop talking in code now. We're, we're writing each other writing notes. Writing different Thanks. notes. So funny. About, about how long known has got, because we've got two lengthy interviews to fit in between now and six, but it's lovely to have you with us. Thanks, KB. Nice to have you with us, Nona Peltier. Uh, the country's biggest construction firm, Fletcher Building, has posted a worse than expected loss. That's right, yes. They, they did make a significant loss. And uh, last year they made a profit of $94 million. This year they made a loss of $119 million. Now that was pretty much signal to the market. The loss and a significant one was yes. absolutely significant. Yes, market. and that was because of their building and interiors business. Right. That's the projects that we have here in Auckland, the uh, International Convention Centre, the Commercial Bay projects, and a few others that were costing more than they expected. So, yeah, $600 million of losses were signaled in February. Now, we're seeing all of that accounted for in this result. So, going ahead, we're expecting a better a better time for Fletcher Building. Certainly, that's their expectation. They were explicitly saying that, weren't they? Yes, However, the market wasn't that convinced because uh, their other business units also underperformed. Uh, they still made profits, but not what the market was hoping for. And that's showing a lot of softness. So basically share price fell nearly, well, about 6%, 39 points, uh, rather 39 cents to $6.51. So that's not a great result. No, the market not. wasn't too impressed with that. We'll no. see what happens. And of course, their shareholders aren't going to get a dividend on a loss. So it's been a tough few years. Yeah, for it really has. Hasn't yeah. It? Uh, on the other hand, you could be a shareholder in specialty dairy milk, uh, dairy company, 18 Milk. 
Yeah, that's right. Which has posted a record profit, although it hasn't been around for that long, has it? Well, never mind. They more than doubled it to $196 yeah, million. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's a large profit for a company, and their revenue rose by more than two-thirds. Not only that, they're capturing market share. They're a real darling in Australia. They're one of, well, let's see. Their baby formula brand in Australia has one-third share of the market, and in China it's 5%. Holy moly. That's large. What are they doing right, Nona? Well, I guess they've got very smart marketing. They're basically a marketing company. They don't produce milk, but they, they're very good at building partnerships. I mean, they have a partnership with Fonterra, for example, now. They've had a long-standing one with Sinlay Milk. Yeah, they're clever. They're very good at marketing. They're selling more fresh milk. You name it. Anyways, the market liked them. Yeah, their share price rose more than 6%. That's 68 cents to $11.81. And you might ask, how did that play out in the market? How did it play out in the market? Well, we rose uh, half a percent overall. So the Fletcher Building share price didn't drag down the market. Overall, we were up uh, half a percent, 47 points up to close at another record, 9163. That's a very good high. And we're seeing that uh, across the markets are a little bit more positive about uh, China and the United States doing a trade deal. The New Zealand dollar is trading higher at 67 U.S. cents. That's also because of Mr. Trump's uh, comments about its own interest rates there. 91.1 Australian and 51.9 pence. Nona Peltier, thank you very much indeed. We appreciate it. Nice to have you with us in the Auckland studio. Uh, it's coming up to 24 minutes to six. This is a subject we've been looking at a great deal on Checkpoint uh, over the past month or so, and it's not only us who've been looking at it. The Minister for Workplace Relations has today met with the CEO of Freightways. as the government begins to look in greater depth itself at the position of so-called independent contractors. Now, over the past month, Checkpoint has highlighted the position of owner-operator courier drivers who work for employers like Freightways and New Zealand Post carrying the costs of purchasing and operating their vehicles without the protection of paid sick leave and annual holidays and in some cases after costs for less than the minimum wage, which doesn't apply to contractors, of course. This is a big picture story as well as a very particular story about the drivers themselves. We've revealed court action is pending with First Union and ProDrive preparing a case to have the drivers reclassified as employees employees with greater protections. Freightways, whose biggest and most well-known brand is New Zealand Couriers, told us they were meeting with the Minister and we caught up with Ian Lees Galloway at Auckland Airport uh, shortly after the meeting, which he told us about. Um, yeah, it was, it was a, the usual kind of meeting that a minister has with a business. They gave me a, a bit of an outline of their history and, and how the contracting model developed uh, in their business. Obviously they, they wanted to tell me the benefits of the contracting model and how it's working well for them and, and for the people who contract with them. But at the same time, you know, I expressed the concerns that have been voiced with me about uh, contractors not having the protection of the Employment Relations Act or the potential for people to be able to end up working for less than the minimum wage once costs are taking out, um, and signalling to them that it is an area that I want to do some work on, and of course that I want to work with them and make sure they're engaged with that work when it starts. It's a hell of a good model for companies like Freightways, for, for all the people who employ independent contractors in the transport business, because the independent contractors assume a great many of the costs, including buying their own vehicle, having the signage put on the vehicle, yeah. buying their own uniform, buying their own scanner if they're in the courier business. Yeah. How do we protect people to make sure that this isn't a master-servant relationship in which they are effectively being exploited, particularly when this is disproportionately likely to be a new immigrant workforce? Yeah, so that's exactly the question that we want to ask uh, and, and carry out some really rigorous work around that. Um, what I said to Freightways today is I have not made any determinations about what the outcome of that work might look like, uh, but what we need to do is sit down with everybody. We're a government that believes in talking to business, talking to workers, talking to everybody who's impacted by the decisions that we're making to co-design what new policy might look like and that yeah the commitment I made to Freightways today is they need to be engaged in that work but also that we do think it needs to be examined they they I think quite strongly expressed a view that they're quite happy with the status quo, they, they, they wouldn't like to see any change in this area, they're nervous about what change might mean. Um, but you know, I, I think we've heard enough stories about people who are vulnerable in these kinds of relationships that it's absolutely incumbent on government to take a look at this and make sure that contracting and the rise of things like the gig economy are working well in New Zealand and that, and that workers are benefiting from those. It's a model that's working well for Freightways. We now have uh, a whole lot of information that, that details 
what drivers are earning in terms of their revenue coming in, uh, what their costs are, uh, running vehicles, depreciation, all of that kind of stuff, and what is left over. And many of them are, and we have the paperwork, earning less than the minimum wage mm. once costs are paid. Mm. Is that a satisfactory situation? It's not satisfactory to me that people are working essentially for less than the minimum wage. Uh, I put that to Freightways. They said that um, they reckon the average contractor gets an income of around 96000 and that once their costs are taken out, um, that that would be around the 70000 mark. Um, I asked them how many hours a day you'd need to work to generate that. They said, you know, sort of 10 to 12 hours a day. Now, that's that's their view. Um, you've do, seen... Do, do, do they provide you with any paperwork? So they're just telling you this stuff. I mean, did they sit you down and say... Minister, here's payroll, here's revenue, here's costs. Did they show you that stuff or did they just say those words? Today they just told me those things. Uh, and as I say, we need to do a more rigorous analysis of... Uh, of not just what Freightways is doing, because this isn't just about Freightways, it's not just about couriers either, it's about contracting relationships and, and, and the new types of relationships that are developing. Um, so yeah, we, we need to do some more rigorous analysis, but yeah, I gave them the opportunity to tell me what their view was on it, that was the view that they gave me. So where to now? Well, as I say, where to now is, yeah, we need to do some proper work around this. Um, I have a very full agenda across workplace relations and immigration, and ACC for that matter. Um, so we need to sequence the, the policy work that we have committed to, and we have uh, set aside some time in the first half of next year to really get stuck into this stuff and to sit down, you know, with the employers, with the businesses, with the courier drivers, with the unions who have expressed concerns about this as well. Now, this is an area where I think, I think change is coming anyway. One of the conversations that we had today was around a lot more of the packages that they're delivering are going to residential areas because you know people are buying things online um, and that's generating more work for the courier drivers but it's not necessarily the most lucrative work. And so they are having to examine their business model in the context of that change that has developed. I think we need to examine the business model and make sure that it's not just working well uh, for the businesses, it's working well for contractors too, and that it's working well for New Zealand as a whole. Ian Lees Galloway at Auckland Airport late this morning. Well, the company he'd just met with, he was flying back to Wellington after the meeting, was Freightways, although the independent contractor model exists throughout the career industry, including in the SOE New Zealand Post. But we've spoken to New Zealand Post in the past. We've never spoken to Freightways. This afternoon, their CEO, Mark Trohier, was available. He told me he discussed with the minister of the company's independent contractor model and why he wanted to protect it, which they and other transport operators want to do very much. I asked Mark Trohia, how many drivers, aka independent contractors, aka business partners, are employed by Freightways? We've got around a thousand, just over a thousand independent contractors. Okay, and let's go through the terms and conditions under which they work for you or with you. Uh, do they get annual leave? So no, they operate like any other small business, John, so they work on the basis of bringing an asset into the business, working that asset to provide the services. They can take uh, time off whenever they wish, but you've got to have someone else running the store. So right. just like a cafe, a Subway sandwich franchise, any of those types of things, absolutely, you can be away from the business, and we have many contractors that'll go away for weeks, sometimes months, guys that'll take a day off every week. And what they do is provide a relief driver, often a family member, a friend, or somebody they share amongst a pool of contractors. They have to be approved to by you, don't they? They don't. They have to be. That makes it sound as if you could just take a day off and get Jack or Betty or whoever, and they have to be approved by you, don't they? They have to have a well, uniform. Look, yeah, effectively you can get Jack or Betty, but you know they can't have a criminal conviction um, and, and those types of things. So there's some minimum standards, absolutely, that you have to meet. Got to have a valid licence, etc. And yes, we do ask them to wear a uniform. That's um, that's pretty standard across the courier uh, okay. industry globally, uh, which uh, works on that type of model. So if you take annual leave, you have to organise your own replacement and pay them yourself. That's right, isn't it? Yes. Okay. Do you get sick leave? If you're sick, what happens? So if you're sick, again, you get someone else to drive your van. Uh, on occasions, if, some, if someone gets sick, you know, at the last minute, we'll have an employee that we can put into the van for them. Right, but normally you would organise someone to replace you and you would pay that person? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Because remember, what's important is, is that the couriers have built up runs and built up customers. 
built up a lot of goodwill through the service they provide. What's really important is that that gets preserved. So absolutely. I mean, I've got a contract. I don't see how that would be preserved. Picking. Sorry, I don't, I don't want to interrupt, Mark, and we're delighted to have you on Checkpoint, <laughs> and, and, and we've waited a while to get you, so I want to hear what absolutely. you're saying. But sure. it seems to me that what's most important about that model is it protects you from costs. Well, no, so what we do is remunerate contractors. So within the models we have, there's remuneration that allows them to pay someone four weeks to do their run uh, if they choose not to do it, if they want to go away on holiday, if they're sick, if they want to go overseas. OK. You, you pay them for working, don't you? We pay them for picking up and delivering right, items. Abso absolutely. Small, yeah, small yeah, businesses absolutely. are the best to pick up and deliver. And that's so what you get, John, is incomes that are far in excess of what you would get if we said, right, everyone can come and work for 17 or 18 bucks and we'll give you another 2% every year and drive my van, use my fuel card. That way you don't get ahead. It's really hard to get ahead with that model. We've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of contractors earning well over, you know, $95,000, $100,000 plus GST doing this type of role. So, sorry, you say um, you've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of contractors yes. earning over 95000 and that's before costs, right? So that's their revenue? That's right. OK, how many earn over 95000 uh, 500. 500 of them earn over 95000 before costs? Yes. And so how many drivers do you have in total, 1,100? So there's, yeah, close, just over a thousand, between a thousand. Uh, okay. And so so yeah. slightly more drivers aren't earning over ninety-five thousand dollars before costs, right? Yeah, correct. Yes. Okay. So half your fleet is earning ninety-five thousand dollars before costs, and half aren't. What sort of hours are they working a week? Well, we don't measure productive hours, so the contractor will work the number of hours they need to complete their run, but also with what fits with their lifestyle. So we've got contractors that hold, work hold, from Hold on, from hold, Mark, sorry, I've got your frequently asked questions here. What are the right. hours I need to work? Generally, well, your day commences at 5am when you must come into the depot to sort freight for delivery. Depending on the run, your day would typically finish between 5.30 and 6.30. Contractors are required to work Monday through to Friday and a half day Saturday, so five 12-hour days is 60. Half Half a day on Saturday is 66 hours a week. So some contractors will work um, around about 12 hours a day, absolutely. Some contractors will work around eight hours a day, some contractors work half days. There's a, there's a, comp, there's a range of different types of contractor options within our fleets. OK, so if you're working 66 hours a week and you are required to work 52 weeks of the year or find a replacement, let's multiply 52 times 66. So that's 3,400 hours, right? So we're going to divide your salary of 95, your revenue of $95,000 by 3,400 and we're getting an hourly rate of $27 before tax and expenses. Well, you, yes, you are through that maths, but I think what you're doing is, is taking something out of a bit of literature and applying it to the average. No, so, not, you, you, you told know. me. You told me those hours are working. Now, let's talk about their costs. <laughs> so they have to buy the van. They have to buy a high ace, for example. Yeah, so couriers generally... Well, no, they can buy whatever van they like, so we'll have couriers that will invest. No, they can't. Um, you, you tell them what vans. You have to approve the vans, and they have to be, what, how many years old maximum, although you, 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 you prefer new, but how many old years old maximum can they be? So couriers will come along and they'll invest in a van. Typically in residential areas, they'll buy a second-hand vehicle. And depending on the type of run they'll do, they'll decide the type of vehicle they need. Typically, that'll be based around cubic capacity, but, um, but it's also a contractor choice. A lot of contractors will like to have a Mercedes van. Some will have a Toyota Hiace. Uh, there's a real range within the fleet. So they're only $27 an hour, on the, and we've, we've gone for the good guys. We've gone for the guys earning $95,000. $27 an hour before costs. Their costs include buying a van, uh, their costs include buying a uniform, their costs include buying the scanner, their costs include having the van de uh, decorated in the colours of whatever branch of freightways they're driving for, let's say New Zealand couriers, their costs include road user charges, their costs include the phone and their costs include fuel, right? 
Yes, yeah, so some of those costs are clearly your, your upfront costs, your capital costs for getting into a business. Again, similar, John, if you invested in a cafe and you had a fit out cost yeah, to get look, up and running, I, I, yeah, and, then, I, I, and then you'll have, abs- and then you'll have absolutely. The, and then, can we yeah, not talk? Then, can we, Mark? Sorry, can we not talk about cafes? I want to talk about career drivers. Yeah, so what, and I'm using so, your figures. I'm using your figures, yeah. and I'm using your good figures. I'm using your top of the range figures. Well, you're so using not, my top. Of, you're using my top of the range hours, and you're using my average. No, no, I'm not, no, no, no. Well, I'm not using your average. You're saying 95,000 is average. And you're using my top of the range hours. Well, no, I'm not. I'm using the hours specified in your question. I frequently asked questions for, for people who want to be drivers. I'm just quoting which, verbatim which, from them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that would be the top of the range hours that you would have in courier fleets. So if we have couriers, John, that will work uh, an eight to five day with a break. And so, what would they earn? What would they be earning? Oh, it, it'll, it depends on the number of kilometres they do and the number of jobs they... Uh, they perform. So, you know, it's a small business based on productivity. It's based on the number of jobs you do. And the more you do, the more you earn, right. which is a fantastic model. John, we've got contractors that earn far more um, than, than you do, which is a fantastic situation, I think. So, so, so I want to talk about the hourly rate. What do you believe the average hourly rate? Let's, let's be really fair. What is the average hourly rate for a freightways driver? So we don't work on hourly rates. Small businesses don't work on hourly rates. And it would be a really hard thing for me to, to give you an hourly rate. Fair enough. What is the average monthly revenue before costs of a freight waste driver? 95,000 divided by 12. OK, 95,000. So what, seven? So that's about... Uh, eight, eight. That's eight thousand dollars per month, right? Eight grand about eight grand eight plus, is ninety-six. Yeah, plus year. GST per month. Yeah. Okay, and from that we've got to deduct all of those costs. We've got to pay yes. tax well, and got, deduct all of those costs. Yeah. So you'll buy a van once, I would imagine, and then you what you'll deduct is your running costs. And what do you buy the van with? I mean, most of the people borrow the money to buy the van, don't they? I'm not being glib with you here. Yeah, no, I, I, me- I just want, I just mm. want to get some s- sort of clarity <laughs> around because you're providing me with revenue figures, but you're being really difficult on the cost side. Yeah, so, because uh, because the cost belongs to the the contract, and every contractor will have a different set of circumstances. So it's a really good point you make around the van. Many contractors will come in with a level of equity that they can buy a van, and they'll have no interest cost and no debt. Some contractors will come in and say, yep, I'll buy a van, I'll put that on the mortgage and they'll pay their prevailing mortgage rate on that asset. There's a real range. There would be very few, from my experience, that would lease a van and pay expensive lease type rates. That's not typically the model. That's a bit like buying a house on a credit card and then renting it out. It just, you know, that's really likely to work. Okay. So I guess the question, because you and I can play tennis, both of us standing at the net, whacking the ball at each other as hard as I, we possibly I doubt can. You, yeah, I doubt you and I will probably agree on, on a lot of well, this. Well, well, yeah, I, 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 I will agree when you give me facts. And, and, and the facts are, what is the average monthly income? And this is a fact I really want, and, 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 and I think we've been asking for it for a month now, of your drivers after costs. The, it depends on the contractor's cost. So typically, John, uh, a contractor's cost, direct costs, would sit somewhere between fifteen and early twenty thousands as a, as a real ballpark average. Really dependent on the number of kilometres you do. So if you're in a tight run where you do eighty odd kilometres, your costs will be relatively low because your direct costs are typically fuel. If you're in a run where you do three hundred kilometres, your costs will be higher because again, your costs are predominantly fuel. R and M on your van, and so you'll have a higher cost base. And, and every contractor is different. John, I think what's important is that since, since your story came out four weeks ago, and uh, it, it raised a bit of publicity, what we did was went out to our fleet and said, look, if anyone's concerned about their level of earnings, talk to your managers, talk to your to your fleet managers. And we haven't had people coming with those concerns. The one concern we have had a lot of couriers coming with is really worried about the change in status. So we've got a lot of contractors that are worried about being classed as employees. So you are saying, and you have every right to say it, that you think this is a win-win, that this model serves you as the owner 
of the brand Freightways and all of the companies, uh, New Zealand Couriers, Sub 60, Post Haste, etc., 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 that Freightways contains and the drivers who are working for Freightways, many of whom over the past few weeks have told us they are really struggling to get by. You're saying, no, that's not the case. This is a win win. Look, it's certainly not what we're hearing. So if there's contractors that are really struggling, we have. We, we talk to our contractors all the time. We have put out an invite to our contractors that, hey, if you're struggling, if you're looking to earn more income, if you want to find a way of reducing costs, come and talk to us. John, that, that's an open invitation all the time. Most of our senior management team have come from being contractors. So the majority of the general managers running those businesses you've quoted have been owner-driver contractors. And it's one of the really neat things about the business, that we've had guys that have come in no qualifications, no skills, no particular uh, specialised licences, come and set up a small business in probably what is, is the, the easiest way in the world to set up a small business, been really successful. And then there's a lot of those people who say, right, I'd like to have a crack at management or work within the business. So the people that run those businesses are ex-contractors. Uh, just before we go, Hawke's Bay and the email that went out to staff saying that the uniforms went up to scratch, uh, new uniforms were going to be unilaterally purchased on their behalf and the money deducted from their income. Is that acceptable? Oh, look, I think the message that I saw um, asked contractors, it's a requirement to wear a uniform. So what our customers want and, is... And you pay for that uniform yourself, right? No, no, no. It's a, yes, an ex, it's an expense for the contractor. Absolutely. So when contractors come into customers' businesses, customers give a high level of trust to contractors. Uh, many of them will give contractors keys to access their premise to either deliver items or to come in and pick items up. So when we have contractors coming in to pick up items, customers need them to be identifiable. They need them in uniforms. They need to know who they are. We deliver items for all sorts of businesses, and it's really important that when you have someone coming in, hold, taking hold, hold on, hold on. Sorry, They're look, really I, I absolutely hear you, Mark, but none of those things are mentioned in the memo that was sent out to the staff. None of those things. I'm going to quote verbatim from what oh, was actually John, said to the staff. Um, yeah, look, I don't disagree. It you are part of New Zealand's it's, premier it's courier company and part of what ensures we stay that way is our image. There are far too many instances of non-compliance on uniforms which must stop as sometimes we look very motley. This is self-protecting by New Zealand couriers, isn't it? You are insisting that contractors who you claim are independent spend more money on newer uniforms so you guys look good. Oh, look, it's really so they look good. Um, you know, contractors' image to their customers is really important. So contractors build business, John, by going in, delivering to a premise, and then saying, hey, do you have any items that are coming out? Is there anything I can take out? They'll ask one of our sales reps to come in and help uh, close the deal and, and win a bit of business. It's really important to them and their image to help them build uh, business, that they have a good professional image. Likewise, customers expect that you're identifiable if you come into their building and you're taking out laptops, if you're a, an IT reseller. Yeah, uh, absolutely. All of that, all that of that. That type thing is really important. And, yeah. and John, that's, I mean, it's universal across every courier company that I know globally. Because they are the face of New Zealand couriers, right? Well, they're the face of their own businesses and New Zealand couriers, absolutely. They're not the face of their own businesses, they're the face of New Zealand couriers, aren't they? They're not wearing their own business, they're wearing New Zealand couriers, aren't they? Well, they're representing themselves in, as their own business. As Are well they as independent contractors? Couriers. Mark, one final question. Yeah. Are yeah. they independent contractors? Can they drive for your competitors, even in the vans they've bought? Well, they don't typically drive for their competitors, no. So that's, that's something we're quite happy to have a look at. I'm not sure if, if Uberizing contractor drivers, taking away any minimum protections and saying, look, just deliver what I've got for you today, go and deliver something else for someone else. I don't think we'd have many contractors that would want to do that. I think that would be a really dangerous thing for the industry. But look, we, we can consider those types of things. I've never had a contractor make that request of us yet. John, thanks very much for your time. I do have another meeting I've got to go to that I'm a bit late for. But, um, yeah, long time coming, so I appreciate the chance to have a chat. Mark Trow here, who's the CEO of uh, Freightways. We've been after that interview for the best part of a month. We really do appreciate him fronting uh, Freightways.
uh, who own uh, New Zealand Couriers Sub 60. I think they are the owner of the most courier companies, uh, and certainly not alone and not fronting. PBT fronted very early on, and we haven't heard from them since. Uh, New Zealand Post gave us an interview. They are an SOE. They operate the same independent contractor model. That is the driver uh, buys the van. He or she drives. They get the signage. They have the signage. So the New Zealand Post, uh, Courier Post, or uh, in Freightways case, New Zealand Couriers, the signage that you see on the side of the van advertising the companies has been paid for by the drivers. The uniforms the drivers wear have been paid for by the drivers. The scanners, when they come to your door, they're about two and a half grand paid for by the, by the drivers. The question is not whether those expenses are legitimate. That's not the discussion. The question that's going to be tested in court is whether that kind of relationship with one company makes you an employee and therefore entitled to protections that independent contractors don't have. I asked Ian Lee, Lee, Ian Lee Scalloway at the airport today whether he felt it would be good if that was tested in court. And he said, yes, he looks forward to seeing what the court determines about that. Lots of uh, feedback coming in. My lovely courier driver told me today his car excess is $1,500 and he's had three minor scrapes this year. Another large cost. They're clearly being exploited. Uh, John, the crucial fact is the depreciation of the van. By the time they pay it off, it's time to buy another one. Transport companies have grown rich off the back of contractors, says Paul from Napier. Uh, thanks for that, John. I was thinking of being a Freightways driver until I heard that person explaining things. Uh, if the courier drivers are working 14 hours a day, is that so? We, didn't, we haven't seen much 14 hours, 12 hours we see quite a lot of. Uh, people are asking, are they running logbooks? That's a good question. I don't the, I know the answer to that. Um, uh, someone said, he is a courier driver, and every time they complain about the hours or the terms and conditions they work under, they're told, refer to your contract. Uh, this person says it's an exploitative situation, and John, van depreciation or van running costs per km, say 75 cents per k, how many k's per shift? Thank you. RNZ News at 6. Ngā mihi nui, good evening. Ko Katrina Batten, aho. The lawyer for a former teacher aide and rugby coach accused of sexual offending against 18 boys says it's all lies. Alosio Taimo has denied 83 charges of sexual offending spanning almost 30 years. Edward Gay has been at his trial in the High Court in Auckland. Alosio Taimo's lawyer, Panama Leaoane, told the jurors in his opening address some of the victims went to the same school and have fabricated their stories. He questioned how his client could have offended in his car in daylight at his home when up to five boys were staying there and in the school sports shed. Mr Leaoane said the sports shed was crammed with equipment and other students and even teachers were around. The trial before Justice Moore and a jury has been set down for 10 weeks. Atui te ko te matua, ko Edward Gayahou. The US President Donald Trump has ignored questions from the media about his former personal lawyer Michael Cohen, who's pleaded guilty to violating campaign finance laws. Cohen said he made payments to influence the 2016 election at the direction of a candidate for federal office. The BBC's Nick Bryant was outside the New York court where Cohen appeared as part of a plea deal. He admitted guilt to eight crimes, including five counts of tax evasion and one count of bank fraud. But it was his admission that he knowingly broke campaign finance laws that are by far the most politically explosive. He admitted to making payments to two women, $150,000 to the former Playboy model Karen McDougal and $130,000 to the porn star Stormy Daniels. He said he gave them money to secure their silence and for the principal purpose of influencing the 2016 election and had done so in coordination with and at the direction of the candidate. Though he did not mention his name. The candidate in question is his former boss, Donald Trump. Nick Bryant reporting. The plea came as a jury in Virginia convicted former Trump campaign ca uh, chairman Paul Manafort of bank and tax fraud charges. The grassroots community of Castle Cliff in Whanganui is shaken after a gang shooting has left a man dead, sparking a large police hunt. A 27-year-old man, who the police are yet to name but RNZ understands was Kevin Ratana, a known member of the mongrel mob, died in Puriri Street yesterday morning. The shooting sent local schools and early childhood services into lockdown for several hours. Armed officers have been guarding the scene. Gary Battersby has run the Pudedi Street liquor store for 15 years and spoke to our reporter Lee Marama McLaughlin. Um, probably Mungrel Mob have come into the Black Power territory as far as I can tell. 
Is it Black Power territory down here? Pretty much, yeah. Well, how's the community feeling? A little bit shaken, I think. You know, we've been pretty quiet in here for yesterday and just about all day today. It's been real quiet. Gary Battersby says he doesn't think the public should be worried as this is a matter between gangs. The Foreign Minister Winston Peters says he intends to help Tonga and other Pacific Islander nations form a plan to repay their debts to China. Last week, the Tongan Prime Minister said his country was suffering serious debt distress and called for Pacific nations to collectively urge Beijing to write off all outstanding debts. Just days later, Akalisi Bohiva contradicted that comment, saying Tonga was very happy with aid received from China. Speaking in Canberra, Mr Peters says he remains concerned about the amount of Chinese debt taken on by some Pacific nations. At 42%, that's far too high for Tonga and for Pacific nations. And our job is to understand their, uh, their fiscal boundaries and fiscal restraints and do what we possibly can with others mm. to help them through into a sustainable outcome economically. Winston Peters. The Justice Minister has reassured victims he's as focused on them as he is on rehabilitating criminals at a key justice summit. The government's been criticised by the National Party for focusing on offenders rather than victims at the summit, with that sentiment echoed by some of those who spoke at the venue in Porirua today. Andrew Little told the hundreds gathered that he would not sign off on any plan for reform that doesn't make meaningful change for victims of crime. It may well be that we'll look at an opportunity to bring just a more victims-focused conference together uh, to hear that, that side of the story more clearly. Andrew Little. Consumer spending has jumped, led by trade and DIY customers boosting sales in the hardware and building supplies sector. Excluding price changes, official figures show seasonally adjusted sales volumes rose 1.1% in the three months to June, compared with 0.3% gain in the previous quarter. Spending at department stores and on food and beverages and electronic goods also rose strongly, offsetting declines in supermarket spending. The annual growth rate edged up to 3.1 per cent. It's five minutes past six. Sport, the All Blacks are set to make just a couple of enforced changes to their starting side as they seek to wrap up the Bledisloe Cup for the 16th straight year. Midfielder Ryan Crotty is unavailable for Saturday's second test at Eden Park after suffering another head knock in the opening test win in Sydney, while wing Rico Ioani suffered a hamstring strain. Anton Leonard Brown and Jack Goodhue combined to play the majority of the game in the midfield last week and are likely to front up again in Auckland. Nehe Milner Scudder could take Ioani's place after playing on the wing for Manawatu at the weekend, and assistant coach Ian Foster was happy with what he saw. We stuck Nehi back for Manawatu to give him a good hit out. His instincts were sharp, he looked good on the outside channels, so we've got Ben who can go there. We've got Damien and, and Geordie, so that whole combination is something that we can play around with. The All Blacks team is to be named tomorrow morning. The veteran netball defender Liana De Brain will return to the ANZ Premiership next year, having signed with the Northern Stars. The 40-year-old former Silver Fern International played for the Adelaide Thunderbirds in the Australian domestic competition this year. And the former Black Caps international Grant Elliott has pulled stumps on his cricketing career. The 39-year-old all-rounder has been playing on the global T20 circuit, most recently with Birmingham in the English domestic competition. He retired from international cricket last year and is best known for his six off South Africa's Dale Steyn to win the 2015 World Cup semi-final for New Zealand at Eden Park. That's the news. Politics. Those of us at the top, and that includes members of parliament and chief executives in the public service, do need to lead by example. A different kind of leak. The system is a leaking tap. The plumbers are people with lived experience of that system who characterise government as painters who came in afterwards and make it look good and uh, take all the credit. So, how do you fix it? Our differences will always be there, and, and that's what politics is. It's not necessarily helpful, but it's a reality. Um, I think we need to focus on those things where we agree. Follow our leads. Morning Report with Guy Naspinar and Susie Ferguson weekdays from 6. Then on 9 to noon, Airbnb launches a new business channel here amid questions over the impact of its 40,000 accommodation listings on the housing market. And after 10, Josh Clark and Chuck Bryant, the pair behind the wildly successful podcast, Stuff You Should Know. Join me, Lynn Freeman, and for Catherine Ryan on 9 to noon after Morning Report on RNZ National.
Met service weather through to midnight tomorrow for the northern half of the North Island. That's from Taranaki and Taupo northwards, including Bay of Plenty. Periods of rain or showers sometimes heavy, with a chance of squally thunderstorms and hail until tomorrow morning. Fine spells increasing tomorrow afternoon. Gisborne and Hawke's Bay, scattered rain developing overnight, then clearing tomorrow afternoon. Whanganui, Taihepe, Manawatu and Torofenua. A few showers turning to rain for a time tomorrow. Kapiti, Wellington and Wairarapa, mostly fine today. Rain at times tomorrow, possibly heavy in Wairarapa. Nelson, Bola and Westland, remaining showers clearing this evening, fine tomorrow. Marlborough, Canterbury and North Otago, fine today. Scattered showers developing tomorrow. Central Otago, Dunedin, Clutha, Southland and Fiordland, rain about the south coast and scattered falls elsewhere. And the Chatham Islands, a few showers today, rain developing tomorrow afternoon. It's coming up to nine minutes past six and you're listening to Checkpoint. Thank you very much indeed, Katrina Batten. Uh, and thanks everyone for being with us for the first time. A former member of US President Donald Trump's inner circle has directly implicated the president himself in a conspiracy to influence the outcome of America's 2016 election. His former lawyer, Michael Cohen, struck a kind of plea agreement with prosecutors in New York and conceded that he made a series of payment to, payments to women, presumed to include the adult film star Stormy Daniels, who claimed she had an affair with Mr. Trump. Mr. Cohen faces up to five years in jail for his crimes, and President Trump's former campaign manager, Paul Manafort, is facing an even longer sentence after he was convicted of several counts of fraud by a jury in Virginia. What's important here is that Mr Cohen, pleaded guilty, said he did it because the candidate directed him to. Our US correspondent Simon Marks has more. The welter of developments came as Donald Trump was in the air on Air Force One heading to a campaign rally in West Virginia. When he left the White House, he could still claim that he hadn't been implicated in any criminal conspiracies relating to the presidential election. By the time he landed, that was no longer possible. Michael Cohen, his former lawyer, a man who worked for Donald Trump and his organisation for years and who we now know taped some of his conversations with the president, entered a guilty plea in Manhattan to a series of crimes for which he faces just over five years in jail. They include hush money payments made to several women on behalf of President Trump, or the candidate and individual one, as he's referred to in court documents. Deputy U.S. Attorney Robert Kuzami. What he did was he worked to pay money to silence two women who had information that he believed would be detrimental to the 2016 campaign and to the candidate and the campaign. Those women include the porn star Stormy Daniels, who upon receipt of a $100,000 payment cancelled a network TV interview in which she was planning to tell her story. I participated in the conduct for the purposes of influencing the election, Mr Cohen told the court. Those are words that will haunt Donald Trump for the remainder of his presidency. But there was more to come in Virginia. The president's former campaign manager, Paul Manafort, was convicted by a jury on eight counts of defrauding the Internal Revenue Service and several American banks. He faces decades in jail and another trial in Washington, D.C. next month. Mr. Trump in West Virginia said he felt very sad about his former aide's conviction. It doesn't involve me, but I still feel, uh, you know, it's a very sad thing that happens. This has nothing to do with Russian collusion. It's a witch hunt and it's a disgrace. That is a simply astonishing thing to say about prosecutors who have now proved that two members of the president's inner circle defrauded America's taxing authorities to the tune of millions of dollars, and that one of them, Michael Cohen, tried to defraud the electorate as well. And most troubling for the president and the men and women who still choose to serve in his administration is the implication that he was also a conspirator in Mr Cohen's crimes. Special Prosecutor Robert Mueller notching up one courtroom victory after another is edging ever closer to the Oval Office. For Checkpoint, I'm Simon Marks in Washington. It's 12 and a half minutes past six. The Crown says a junior rugby coach and teacher aide used his position of trust in the community to sexually abuse 18 boys over nearly 30 years. Alosio Taimo has denied 83 charges relating to boys as young as nine and has gone on trial at the High Court in Auckland. Our court reporter Edward Gay filed this report. 
The Crown Prosecutor Jasper Road said Alosio Taimo was a respected member of his community who used his position of power to prey on the boys. He abused them frequently, repetitively, in a number of different ways, in a number of different locations. That included in the school sports shed, in his car and in his home. He was well respected as a community member, as an experienced teacher aide and as a successful rugby supporter and coach for young Ripper rugby teams. He plied the boys with rugby gear and the use of his PlayStation to take advantage of them. It was this trust that allowed the defendant to be in a position to care for these boys, or at least that's what their parents thought, allowing him to transport the boys around to and from rugby training, to and from school, and often let them stay at his house or even live with him for extended periods of time. Alosio Taimo was held in high regard by parents and others in the community. And it was this trust that the defendant ultimately exploited and abused for his own pleasure. It was this trust that allowed the defendant to get away with it for so long. One of the witnesses will describe how, as a boy, he and Mr Tymore broke into a kindergarten classroom and Mr Tymore sexually assaulted him. Mr Rhodes said the witness will also describe how Mr Tymore would assault him if he refused to be abused. He said one of the victim's mothers confronted Tymore. She says he dropped to his knees. He said what he said I did to him is true. He was crying. He apologised and he promised never to do it again. Mr Rhodes said the woman never went to the police. That happened years later in 2016. He said a woman heard her nephew talking to another child about what Mr Tymore had done to him. She knew her son had also been in the care of Mr Tymore and contacted him only to learn that he too was a victim. Understandably upset, she ended up calling the police, and you'll hear about that kicking the whole thing off. Mr Taimo's lawyer, Panama Le Aoane, said the allegations were all lies. They will tell you lies upon lies about this man who was a mentor who helped them through their period of time when they're young men and they have been able to move on. Mr Le Aoane said the boys attended the same school. And the defence position is, is that these boys have got their heads together and they've talked about these sorts of things about sexual abuse and that's why they've come up with these allegations. Just why they would make the stories up, Mr Le Aoane didn't say. He said there was no offending in Mr Tymore's home because it was crowded with up to five boys. He likened it to Britomart train station. Mr Le Aoane also rubbished allegations the offending took place in the school shed. How was it that nobody saw anything? How was he able to keep these things secret? Away from the limelight, away from the glare of other children or other adult teachers who would have been walking around monitoring what was going on. The trial before Justice Moore and a jury is set down for 10 weeks. Moti ho taka o te ahi ahi, ko Edward Gayaho. 16 minutes past six. The Justice Minister is trying to reassure victims he is focused on them as he is on rehabilitating criminals as tensions, well, reach boiling point at a key justice summit. The conference ends tonight with Andrew Little promising every idea there has been noted. But with hundreds of people from different parts of the system in one place, it hasn't been smooth sailing. Political reporter Gia Garrick has been covering the summit in Porirua. The mother of a three-year-old who was murdered broke down in tears today when a Māori woman claimed Pākehā did not know what it was like to be victimised. Jane Crothall's daughter Brittany was killed in 1997 by a former boarder at their Christchurch home. She subsequently decided to meet with the man convicted of her daughter's murder, Luke Sibley, something noted by Justice Minister Andrew Little. It was interesting what Jane said about you know, the, obviously the trauma she went through, still feeling, but actually she said one of the important things was being able to confront the offender against her. And I think that's right, but we've got to understand that, that kind of restorative justice approach, that's got to be victim driven, it's got to be at a timing that suits them. But we can also see the difference that that can make. And it's not about either or, it is about dealing with both. It wasn't the only moment of tension at the conference. Yesterday, the Corrections Minister Calvin Davis was shouted at as he left the stage due to comments about young men joining gangs all ending up as bad eggs. But regardless of their views, all of the attendees had a request, a plea or advice for the government. It speaks to the need for 
systemic change, really transformative change, and my hope is that is what comes out of this hui, because it's been called for pretty much my entire life from Māori communities. So one way that we could reduce recidivism dramatically, I believe, is by using Section 27 reports in a more comprehensive way. We're all dumb. I was a dumb park here until I read Constantine's book, and 90 per cent of our mayors and councillors are dumb and white, and we're not going to get over this until we become better educated. We have our young men in prison hanging themselves. It's one of the big reasons, so I implore the government to step up and take care of it. A big criticism from the National Party before the summit even began was that it focuses too much on criminals at the expense of victims. That sentiment was echoed by some at the summit this morning. But Andrew Little took the stage before lunch today to dispute that. From my point of view as Minister of Justice, I will not sign off on a programme of reform that does not make meaningful change for victims of crime. Mr Little said afterwards it's a huge and complex area which the government may look to refine down the track, including perhaps holding a victims conference. Many are optimistic this government will break down the barriers needed for change. Others were more wary, one long-time public sector worker saying every new government comes in with a plan for justice reform. We've had work streams like effective interventions under the Helen Clark <laughs> Labor government and then when National took over we had drivers of crime and then the new Labor government we've got this so to me it's like a cyclical thing. But all agreed the proof would be in what happens to prisons. If they don't deliver this place has been full of activists who have been wanting this stuff for um, 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 years so I think that we, we will be able to hold them to account and, um, and they're talking about bringing us along for the ride so hopefully that happens. Don't want all those prolific stories of people's experiences to be lost in a document that's going to lack the response it needs. What I would like to see that there are some key messages and that can be really brief and short, one or two, that is going to leave today and that there's going to be a time frame in which they're going to be able to deliver that. The summit wraps up tonight. From Porirua for Checkpoint, Gia Garrick. 20 past six. U.S. authorities have deported a 95-year-old New York City man believed to be a former guard at a Nazi labor camp to Germany. But it's not clear what happens next. German investigators have unearthed too little evidence of direct involvement in murder to issue an arrest warrant. Lucy Fielder reports. A man accused of being a former guard at a Nazi labor camp has been deported from his home in New York City to Germany. This picture of Yakiv Pauli, now 95, was taken back in 1949, the year he became a U.S. citizen. He served as a guard in the Travniki labor camp in Poland, the White House said. There, about 6,000 Jewish men, women and children were shot dead in 1943 in one of the largest massacres of the Holocaust. Pauli has been taken to a home for the elderly in Arlen, Germany, but it's not clear what happens next. The prosecutor who heads Germany's Nazi hunting bureau says investigations have unearthed insufficient evidence to prosecute. So Germany has issued no arrest warrant. In, Deutschland reicht es nicht. In Germany, being a member of a criminal organization like the Nazi SS is not enough to be prosecuted for. Even being trained at a camp is not sufficient. The aid and the participation in a murder must be proven. Some top Nazi leaders were put on trial right after World War II at Nuremberg. But critics say many senior figures escaped, leaving their juniors, small cogs in the Nazi death machine, to be put on trial decades later. This is Fielder reporting. A former Delta Energy manager, we're back in New Zealand now, whose public expression of safety concerns led to WorkSafe auditing power lines, says the company hasn't fully delivered on maintenance. Richard Healy left his job with Delta in 2016 after raising concerns about neglect of power lines in Otago. Two days after resigning, he went to work safe with his concerns. Two years on, he says Aurora Energy, the company which contracts Delta to maintain the lines, both owned by Dunedin City Council, still has untold power poles that put the public in danger. That's his claim. The past few days, he's highlighted in videos the rot in one of Aurora Energy's poles, loaded with high voltage assets in Green Island and Dunedin near a primary school and his local pub. He says despite work done and money spent, not enough has changed. It's pretty much gone backwards. Um, 
hard to believe, considering the vast amount of money that this has cost the, the people of Dunedin and Central Otago. But yeah, backwards is the only way I can describe it. In what way? Well, John, initially I was quite naive when I went to uh, WorkSafe and uh, later later complained about this. And I thought, you know, like most people would tend to do, that we have government agencies that are out there to protect us from, well, rogue players and just incompetent people and, you know, bad outcomes. Uh, but it turns out that actually those government bodies aren't very good at the job. And so what's happened with Aurora is they've spent an awful lot of money, but they've targeted the wrong things, and some of the most dangerous assets have been left to simply erode away. Literally, in the case of some stuff that you posted on Facebook, right? Yeah, literally. So in those posts, I pointed out uh, some poles which had been replaced. Now, you know, you'd wonder how this happens, but they were poles that didn't need to be replaced. And I pointed out one very dangerous pole right next to my local cafe, my local pub and my local primary school, which hasn't been replaced and is in a very dangerous condition. Tell me about the wires that uh, that pole holds up. So that, that pole is holding up uh, a high voltage circuit, so uh, that's, you know, very dangerous. So to put that in layman's terms, if you think about sticking your finger in a light socket, well, this is uh, 25 times worse. So there's 25 more times more grunt in that circuit up on top. Then below that, there's a low voltage wire. So it's the same wire that feeds your house. So that's the sort of danger that you're talking about if you touch uh, an installation in your own home. Uh, on top, the very top of the switch, there's a high voltage cable um, and a high voltage switch. So quite an important network infrastructure. So quite a, quite a busy pole. Richard, we're screening the footage of what you did, but for people who are listening on the radio, can you describe what you were able to do with that poll? <laughs> yeah. So I've watched that poll over a number of years, uh, and it's and it's on a, a decent lean, and it's very, very obvious. It's in a, in a very steep bank, and it's very, very obvious to anyone with any industry knowledge that the foundation strength isn't good on that poll. So uh, yeah, I got sick of looking at it. Every day I pass it on my way to the cafe. So the other day I stopped and decided to examine it a bit more closely and I pulled my screwdriver out of my car and I found that I could pull, push a, a seven inch screwdriver as deep as I liked into that pole from a number of different directions. Uh, since then I went back with a, I borrowed a fish slice, fr slice from my favorite cafe, went back to the pole and found that I could actually push it clean through the pole. So probably a reasonable indication it's not in great nick. Right, and what has been the response to you posting this on Facebook? Well, well this morning, by nine o'clock, uh, I went out uh, to have a look at the poll again, or actually to have a cup of coffee and walk past the poll, and there are two marks on the footpath for new poll positions. So with a bit of luck, we're going to see that poll uh, replaced very quickly. And uh, I, I sort of don't attribute that to what I've done, although I might have kicked it off. Uh, I attribute that to the 300 very angry mothers of the children at the school next door who clearly, uh, from the Facebook response, made Aurora very aware of their views on the topic. What needs to happen to make sure that there are no unsafe polls left? Look, uh, one of the problems here, John, is that there are a number of government agencies involved and none of them are quite sure what their role is. Uh, WorkSafe have a role, Energy Safety Service have a role, Energy Author Electricity Authority have a role, the Commerce Commission have a role. Not only does that mean that, that uh, the efforts to fix this are rather confused, but it also means that if someone falls down on the job, they've got plenty of other people they can point the finger at and say it was actually them who failed and, and not their own group. So uh, pretty much what needs to happen is one agency needs to take the lead on this, and instead of just looking for... Uh, a number of poles to be replaced. They need to have enough people, competent people on the ground to ensure that the poles that are replaced are the dangerous ones that present the risk. But that just hasn't happened. Rich, Richard, that pole um, opposite your local pub beside the primary school that you walked past on the way to the cafe, which you were able to, and for people who are listening, I've absolutely seen the footage, you were easily able to jam uh, a screwdriver into it. Uh, no issues at all, right up to the handle, and in fact, probably uh, if you'd given it a good kick, the handle would have gone in as well. What would happen if that had gone down? Uh, it would have been pretty catastrophic, John. That's... Um 
a reasonably busy main arterial road and the pole would have fallen across the road. As well as the pole falling across the road, there would have been two spans of low tension falling across the road, so live wires everywhere. On top of the pole is high tension. That's a really dangerous uh, bit of equipment, and that would have been on the ground as well. So for people in the immediate area, there's the obvious risk of the falling objects, the risk of electrocution, the risk of entanglement by vehicles backwards and forwards. Uh, it would have caused a pretty large outage, so there would have been several hundred people without power for several hours. The thing that really worries me is that is outside a damn primary school. So you and I might have the sense not to go near a downed wire. Five, six-year-old school kids, not quite so certain that that would have been a good outcome. So, you know, it would have been a fairly catastrophic event. Uh, Richard Healy talking to us earlier this afternoon. Paula Goodman, who's clearly seen the footage, is emailed in. The point is, John, the lines are holding the pole up, not the other way around. Disgusting. Uh, Aurora has this evening confirmed the Green Island power pole was inspected and tagged as hazardous back in June. It says the pole is scheduled for replacement in the next two weeks. We asked Aurora Energy to tell us exactly how many power poles it has in a similar state to that one in Green Island. In other words, how many power poles it has identified as hazardous. Its response is that an independent review will find out what information Aurora has on the state of its assets when it concludes later this year. As for WorkSafe, it says it's been engaging with Aurora for a number of years. It says Mr Healy's concerns should be addressed to Delta Aurora as it's their responsibility under health and safety law to ensure that the polls do not pose a risk. Not WorkSafe. Those statements and after that interview this evening, that is Checkpoint for this evening. Thank you so much for being with us. We really appreciate the privilege of your company. I'm about to have a coughing fit so we're going to fade up the theme and thank you for being with us and say we hope to see you again tomorrow at five. RNZ News Headlines at 6.30. The lawyer for Alosio Taimo says the 83 sexual offending charges the former teacher aide and rugby coach faces are all lies. Armed officers have been guarding the site in Puriri Street, Whanganui, where a 27-year-old father of two was shot dead yesterday morning. The Transport Minister has made it illegal for wheel clamping companies he's described as predatory to charge more than $100 to free a car. And Donald Trump's former lawyer has implicated the president by saying he violated campaign finance laws at the direction of the candidate for the principal purpose of influencing the election. Our next news and weather is at seven. The number of people wanting to explore New Zealand is increasing, but how much access are farmers prepared to give? There's many, many farmers who just love having visitors onto their property, but there's a level of respect that's needed to maintain that, that relationship. You're